Hi everyone, my name is Sam from AffairRecovery.com. Today I'm joined by Amanda Asproni, who has quickly become a fan favorite of many of you followers. And today we're going to talk about cop-outs of the unfaithful, also known from a therapist's clinical terminology as... Ego defense mechanisms. So when you start talking about healing from infidelity, we unfaithful have, shall we say, a difficulty accepting help, getting help, going all in, and we use these kind of, I call them cop-outs, to either excuse our behavior or blame our behavior on you, the betrayed, and you call them... Ego defense mechanisms. So break that down. What does that mean on a understandable level for us rookies. Okay, so for those of us trained in psychodynamic um, theory, it's basically the subconscious defense mechanisms that someone, when they feel like they're under attack, they are in a life or death threatening situation, will employ to try to protect their physical body or, in the case of the unfaithful, their mental their, health, maybe their image, our pride, your self-image, our, self -image. Pride, our mm -hmm. image, our yes. shame, your self-esteem, so if we are battling shame, and again, we're talking about just the unfaithful today. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if we've got a lot of shame, we're going to throw out these defense mechanisms or these cop-outs to take the responsibility off ourselves? And to not go anywhere near it and just, you know, sweep it under the rug and move on into the future. We unfaithful, and from the countless unfaithfuls I've talked to, man and woman, over, I don't know, two decades. One of the biggest ones that I have heard my own self use two decades ago, as well as unfaithfuls left and right, is we don't need help or we don't need extra help. I know what we need to do or we should be able to figure this out on our own. Tell us why that's a cop-out. It's a cop-out because, number one, it's the unfaithful spouse trying to control the recovery process and trying to control the healing. And you just had an affair. You really should not be thinking that you are in a position to be controlling something that is about healing, getting healthy, right? I didn't even think about that. I had so many other thoughts, but you, I think, hit the nail right on the head. Is it that we're trying to control the recovery process or is it that we're also trying to control our image? Yes, because you're trying to control your image, you want to control the process because you don't want anybody outside to come in and put in their two cents or take over control. And ultimately, it's not just about image usually, but you don't want to lose your partner and you're afraid to let anybody else in on that. Is it true? I heard this said and I subscribe to it, but I want to get your take on it. And we actually have not talked about this before, but isn't it true that if someone's, maybe it's not a universal truth, but if someone's not willing to get help, is it because they know that what they're doing or how they're treating their partner is wrong? Mm, no, actually. It's usually more about they are trying not to feel the impact they're trying to stay away from the pain and they're trying to stay away from the shame. The self-image is rooted in the shame, right? If they can hold on to their self-concept, they don't have to deal with the awful thing that they did. So the next one is, if you would stop talking about it, mm -hmm. we could heal. I know none of you unfaithfuls have ever said, if you'll just stop talking about it. But a lot of us have said, you know what? If you could get over it and stop talking about it, we would probably heal a whole lot faster. Why is that such a defense mechanism? Right. So again, when you think of ego defense mechanisms, you have to also remember that they're subconscious. The most challenging cases of this I have had have actually been with female unfaithfuls. And I think that that's because we know we see that their level of shame is so much greater because the stereotype is, you know, men cheat, women don't, which is not the truth. But so the reason that they want to go in this direction with this defense mechanism. Again, it's the same thing. They want to avoid pain. If they don't have to talk about it, it can be, it's denial. Did it really even happen? Let's just pretend normal. And it does temporarily make it worse. And right. that doesn't make any sense to them. It's opposite land. Why would we talk about something that then makes you more upset, more sad? Now you're talking about divorcing me. So from their perspective, you can see. It makes sense. It makes sense, like this is not helping. But what we don't understand 
is that you can't really heal unless you can talk about it. Right. It's like having to get your arm reset when you break it. The doctor has to hurt you more before you can then heal correctly. So they heal, but you know, comes out five years later, they don't heal right. And that's a, a great point. Here's another one. And this is a biggie, so everybody get ready. I wouldn't have cheated. <laughs> I wouldn't have cheated if you weren't such, or if you weren't like this, or if you didn't do so graciously, you hold our lives in your hand. Help the betrayed who probably just jumped out of their seat and wanted to scratch my face off. So help the betrayed, but help the unfaithful understand also, man, what does that do when we say that? Mm -hmm. So when you're first in recovery, also remember that pretty much everybody is in a regressed ego state, which means you're in black and white thinking. You're like in a teenager brain. It's all or nothing. So the first thing we do is talk about all or nothing thinking. And we talk about like action, reaction, action, like one thing leads to another. So I say maybe. Maybe, maybe that contributed to it, but there are lots of couples who their partner did this to them and this is how they handled it. This is how they handled it. So yes, these issues could have been happening in the marriage for these reasons. Have we even identified them? And then this was your dysfunctional coping mechanism. You always would have had an option to ask for divorce, ask for separation, right? You aren't powerless. So you make them understand that it's both. And it's not both from the perspective of, yeah, I cheated because you were such a bad partner. Mm -hmm. It's, well, you weren't perfect, but that in no way justifies my choices of having multiple affairs or any type of infidelity, right? Right. Maladaptive coping mechanism. And your spouse could come back at you and say, well, you did this and you did this, but I didn't cheat. The other point that I address with the clients when the unfaithful is saying, if you wouldn't have done this or you stopped doing that, okay, yes, let's say that's true. Now, as the unfaithful, they want the betrayed to understand the context of why they ended up having the affair because they don't want their spouse to just look at them as a person who woke up one day and went out and did something very harmful and destructive, right? So again, it's flipping it around and it's saying, okay, so let's say yes, your partner stopped doing this or they started to do that. We want to do the same thing to be congruent. Why were they acting like this? So mm -hmm. it's really about building a narrative and externalizing it. So it's them against whatever it was that came in, whatever negative patterns of relating or trauma or outside circumstances. So they can work as a team to address all the different ways that there have been wounds, obviously with the infidelity being the massive one. I did an interview with a mentor couple and something that they said that was fantastic was it's us against the problem. Yes. But when I, the unfaithful say, well, if you weren't such a blankety blank, I wouldn't have cheated. That's not us against the problem. That's basically you're the problem, right? It's narcissistic one up, one down, win or loser, and it will never work. Here's another one. You came in not too long ago and did fantastic on developmental trauma. Michael Webb, a mutual friend of ours, came in and talked about trauma. So there's been a pretty large amount of betrayed spouses going, you know, Sam, I understand that my unfaithful has developmental trauma. I don't really care because they're using it to justify their affairs or they're using it to get me to go easy on them. So maybe from an expert clinician like you, you can break down the idea that even though there's developmental trauma, that is not an excuse for us to go outside the marriage. Yes, I'm thinking that my next tattoo is gonna be and, so I can just show it to my clients because it's and. So I just had a couple this week that I worked with, love them, the husband comes in for session and says, my wife says she's entirely sick of me talking about my 10-year-old. Then the wife comes in the session the next day. If he says anything else about his 10-year-old. Yeah, exactly. And I said, tell me why. Because it's a justification. It's an excuse. So, and this is the developmental trauma. And you still have the right to process the pain. You still have the right to be hurt. He still is going to show up for you and comfort you. You asked him to explain. So, it's keeping them in the and and in the higher level cortex thinking, not regressing because they flood. And I think 
we unfaithful are always looking for a way for you guys to go easy on us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's also the truth that we unfaithful, when we start to understand developmental trauma, the bells and whistles go off and we go, that makes a lot of sense now why I've done what I've done. But that doesn't compute for the betrayed. What computes better, and you can finish this thought, but in my estimation, what computes better is, hey, I'm understanding more about why I've acted out and I'm so sorry because shouldn't there be this mutual, I'm learning more about why I acted out, which is helping me learn more about how I violated you and, and hurt you and devalued you. I mean, you finished that. Time. Right. But it's also reminding the betrayed spouse that what they're subconsciously looking for is a magic wand that is going to make the pain go away. So they go into it not really knowing that they're looking for a why because they think once they get it, they're going to feel better. But mm. you still have to go through the grief cycle. You still have to grieve it. Is it possible to grieve what's happened while still healing? Mm -hmm. And that's where I try to get the couple to go. He wants to talk about his 10-year-old so that you can see his adult step out and support you understand the 10 year old, but under, understand that he gets that the 10 year old's way of thinking, it was a lot of cognitive distortions, a lot of developmental trauma. Sometimes there's addiction, but now it makes sense, which means they can be safer in the future. Right. Which helps prevent relapse. Absolutely. Because now I know myself so much more, yes. but I'm still responsible Absolutely. for my behavior. Yes. As always, it's a riveting conversation when you can talk to someone who's in the foxhole with people in crisis every single day. So for those that maybe aren't experienced with your credentials and your expert qualifications or how they can find you, why don't you tell the audience how they can find you? Um, my name is Amanda Asproni and my practice is Healing Affairs and the website is healingaffairscounseling.com and I specialize in developmental trauma, betrayal trauma, marital intimacy, addiction and affair recovery. It's essential that whatever help you're getting, that they are experts, that they can come from a perspective of not just they've studied it, but they've been through it, they get it, and that they are safe. Thank you so much for joining us today.